be in Second Samuel chapter ten. Uh, I'm sorry, chapter eleven today. But while you're finding your place, uh, we're going to be in some familiar verses of scripture today. Some that I don't like to preach from, to be honest with you, unless the Lord just nudges me and tells me to. And when He tells me to, that's what I do. Uh, because when you preach something that uh, deals with any kind of sin, a lot of people think that, well, you're picking on me or you know something about me. Uh, before I read what I want to read, though, I want to say this. Uh, some people say, well, you only preach things, certain preachers only preach things because they know what's going on in somebody's life. Now, I don't do that, and I don't like to do that, and I don't really like to hear somebody do that, but let me ask you another question to go with that, is if somebody does, or if a preacher does know something going on in your life and he preaches against it, does it change the fact that you need to change? No. Sure don't. Amen. Amen. If the Bible is what it is, and it says what it means, and it means what it says, then it don't matter when I preach it, it still applies to your life and mine. Amen. Whether you're in that situation or you're heading in that situation, God's got some detour signs, amen, to tell you which way to go. Amen. But I, I read this not too long ago. It was some years ago. Uh, I can't remember when it was, but I, I wrote this down and it's just as prevalent today, if not more so than what it was back then. Uh, I'm going to read the scripture in just a minute. Bear with me. We'll get out of here at least by four o'clock. You know, don't, I'm just kidding. But anyway, it says, I, I wrote this down years ago and listen, and it makes so much sense where we are today in this life that we live. We have fancier houses, but broken homes. We have bigger men, but smaller character. We have more degrees and less sense. We got more conveniences, but less time. That makes sense, huh? More knowledge, but less judgment. We got more medicines and less wellness than we've ever had before. We've built bigger houses for smaller families. We've multiplied our possessions and reduced our values. I'll say that again. We've multiplied our possessions, but we reduced our values. We talk too much, love too little, and hate too often. That bears repeating again, too. We talk too much, we love too little, and we hate too often. We've learned to make a living, but not to make a life. We've added years to our life, but not life to our years. We went to the moon, but we can't walk across the street to win a soul. We've conquered outer space, but not inner space. We've done larger things, but not better things. We plan more and we accomplish less. We've cleaned up the air and we have polluted our souls. Ain't that something? Long time ago when I first read that, I, thought, I said, man, that fits today so much how we're living our life. <clears throat> Don't it? And you know what? As time goes on and time goes in the past till we see a new day, it just keeps getting closer to what I just read to you. That's the way we are. Ain't it? I mean, uh, we have multiplied our possessions and reduced our values. Is there something wrong with having possessions? Absolutely not. The Bible said in Ecclesiastes, this is your portion in life that God's given you. Enjoy it. Be a blessing. But it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Amen. So if God gave it to you, you ought to be willing to give back. Amen. To help others. But we have, we have, a, we have multiplied our possessions, but we have reduced our values. That's a shame because our values ought to be at the top of the list. Amen. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness, and then these other things shall be added unto you. Boy, how the world has that backwards. We seek everything but God, and then want God to fix everything that we messed up on that path. Amen. And then we question God why we got here. How we got here is because of the poor decision making that we put God at the back instead of the front. Amen. If you have your Bible, Second Kings, I welcome you. I love you. Good to see you this morning. Amen. Y'all are awake, right? Amen. Amen. Don't fall asleep in the message. You might get something out of it. Second Samuel chapter 11. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. And then we'll just read the Lord tells me stop. I really don't have no stopping point because I wasn't planning on preaching this anyhow. Second Samuel chapter 11. Uh, familiar scripture here. Now before I get in this scripture, I want to say this. Most of you know this is about the sin of David and Bathsheba. Most of you, when I said the chapter, you knew where it was. You've heard preachers preach about it. But I want to tell you this, when I read these scriptures and I talk about David and his sin with Bathsheba, I don't ever preach this as a, as a tool to bring up your past and remind you of something God delivered you from. You know what I'm saying? 
I never preach this to remind you of something that you made a mistake in and trying to bring it back up so that you can be tormented by it. That's not my intention. That's not God's intention. You ought to look at that. If God ever delivered you from a sin that you committed in the past, you ought to look at these scriptures and they say, I thank God that I have peace in my heart because God has forgiven me and put that under His blood and I don't have to worry about that sin ever being brought up to me again and I've been delivered from that sin and I'm going to walk in the newness of life, learn from my mistakes and not do the same thing that I've done to get me in that shape. That's, the way, that's why I preach this today. It's to help you and to show you, look, look what God helped me out of. It is not to bring up your past and make you feel guilty again all over for what God has already forgiven you of. That's not my intention and I hope you can't, don't take it that way. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. My introduction might be as long as my sermon. I don't know. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when the, uh, the kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. Then they, they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged uh, Rabbah and Rabbah, or how you pronounce that? But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Let me bring up something right here. You don't find out the next day that you're with child. That tells you there's some months that went by since the sin took place. When she comes back and says, listen, they didn't have a doctor on every corner in a hospital in the ER for you to run to. There's some time had, had some time had to go by. Some things had to take place in the woman's body for her to realize I'm with child. You know what that tells me, Brother Jonathan? David had some time to think about what he'd done before he found out the effects of it. Yep. Yep. Peter had some time between the first denial and the second. He had some time, as the Bible said, about a space of an hour. Hey, God gave him a little bit of space of time to think about what he'd done the second time before he'd done the third. God always gives us time and a space to repent from our sin before we fall into some other sin. But instead of running to God, we run from God. And find ourselves in a worse shape than we was to start with. So it says, she sends a message and says, I'm with child. And David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. This is the woman's husband. He's out there in battle. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was coming to him, David demanded of him how Joab did. And how the people did and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house. And there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all his servants uh, of the Lord, uh, of his Lord. And he went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down to his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest not, camest thou not from thy journey? When, uh, when then, why then didst thou not go down to thy house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my Lord Joab, uh, and, and, and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and lie with my wife as thou livest and as thy soul lives? I will not do this thing. We need more Uriahs in the church, don't we? It says, I will not do what you're trying to make me do. I want to preach on this thought today. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Never is. Sin will take you further you want to go. Make you stay longer you want to stay. And make you pay more than you want to pay. I understand this won't be no shouting message this morning. But it will be one to help you if you'll pay attention. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this time to come together. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. You've been so good to us. We ask you as we gather around to get to the table of grace again this morning. I ask God that you'll bless this meeting, Lord, that you'll meet with your people as you've done so many times before. Instill in us the desire to follow the Word of God. Instill in us, Lord, that right spirit, that joy, the Spirit of the Lord, that we may, Lord, obey the Word of God and not our own. 
spirit and our own words. God, help us to draw closer to you, Lord, whatever it takes, Lord, to lay aside the sins, the weights and sins that do easily besets us. God, help us to do what's pleasing in your sight. God, increase our faith by the things that we go through. And I want to thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for saving my soul and for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. Now, I, I didn't read all the scripture, but we are going to read some more scripture. So bear with me. Uh, we know that David has now committed a sin with a woman named Bathsheba. How many times men and women of God who are in the house of God. Now listen, this happens a lot outside the house of God when people are not saved, okay? That's what sinful people do. But it ought not be in the house of God. It ought not be that once you get saved that you fall into a sin like this and be enticed by the, and, and let that sin be conceived and bring forth you know, death and spiritual death. That shouldn't take place, but oh, how often it happens. And you know how it happens the same way it happened with David. The same way. The, the devil has never had to change his tactics because they've always worked on the human mind. They've always worked on the human body. And I want you to notice something. This starts out, this chapter, talking about a battle taking place. And who is king over Israel at the time? David is. How many kings have you ever seen stay back home when he sent out his men to fight a battle? David should have been in the battle, not on his rooftop looking at some woman. He, not been, he ought not have been looking in the direction, but he never should have been at home to start with. I would never tell you how to fight a battle if I ain't willing to get in the battle with you. If I'm not going to fight the battle, how can I tell you how to fight the battle? David was telling them, go out and fight the battle, but I'm going to stay back here. Now, I know this is David's fault. David is the one in the wrong. But let me tell you something. He ain't the only one in the wrong. It takes two to make this sin take place. And let me tell you something. If you, I'm, I, let me ask all of you women. If you live beside President Obama, don't you think you know where he lived? If you, if you live beside the White House, don't you think that's his domain? Don't you think that's where he lives? You know that by now if you live beside him. Hey, let me tell you something. Bathsheba knew where David lived. He, she, knew, she knew where the king's castle was. Maybe she should have found a different place to bathe. He ain't the only one walking in sin and enticing this thing. I'm telling you, if she knew where the king's palace was and she could see his porch, don't you know he, she knew that he could see her from his porch? But she's still done it. What I'm trying to tell you is, ladies, there's places you ought not go and people you ought not be around and things that you not ought to put yourself involved in because it will entice you to commit sin that you never intended on committing before you went to that spot. I'm just telling you how it is. I, I'm trying to help. I'm trying to do some preventive maintenance and help you to not fall in the same sin that Bathsheba fell. Everybody say that was David's sin. It was Bathsheba's too. The Bible said, flee the very appearance of evil. When they come to get her, I know he was the king, but she has a willing mind and a willing spirit and she can make her own decisions. She could have ran from the command of the king if she wanted to. But she didn't. Am I pointing out her sin more than his? No, I'm just saying both were in the wrong. And both were in the wrong place at the wrong time when they shouldn't have been. And let me tell you something, strong Christian, whoever you think you are that preach, sing, teach Sunday school, deacon, I don't care who you are, you put yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time looking at the wrong thing and you're going to fall just like David did and just like Bathsheba did because this flesh is strong and it desires to commit sin. And if you're not walking in the Spirit, you're going to fulfill the lust of your flesh. Yes, sir. Amen. Yeah. David shouldn't have been at home and Bathsheba shouldn't have been in that water. She should have been some other water and he should have been in a battle and they'd have never seen each other and they'd have never, this would have never happened. But then let me tell you something. Well, that didn't, that didn't end it because sin never stops at the beginning point. Once you go to the beginning point and you let, uh, allow sin to happen in your life, it begins to grow and grow. And David had to tell lie after lie after lie in order to try to cover up the past lies. Sin will always make you do that. Sin will always make you tell more lies to cover up the lies you've already told what I'm trying to tell you right here is don't lose what you got for something you don't need Amen. some of you are standing testify about how good God is to you and you're talking about how God's blessed you and I can do that this morning boy God sure has been good to me 
But I sit here and tell you about how good God's been to me when I think about all the blessings I have when I leave this place. This is good. But guess what? When I go back home, there's more blessings there. I have a family. I have a home. I have a job. I have income. I have life. I have it more abundantly. God has blessed me coming and going. I feel like God's blessed me way greater than I deserve. But if I got all that and I realize that and I acknowledge that, I don't need to lose what I got for something I don't even need. I don't need to lay down what God's blessed me with for something the devil's got to offer me. The devil has nothing to offer me. I came to God to get away from him and I sure don't need to go back to what he has to offer me. If God's blessed you with it, you better hang on to it because there's some things out there you don't need and it'll snatch away what you already got. Don't, don't leave what you got for something you don't even need. You know, he ended up going to get this man Uriah out of the field because he wanted to deceive the people in case something everybody found out. That way he could say Uriah's come out of the field and he's went home to be with Bathsheba. Therefore, it's his child. That's not mine. What's a lie? That's what the devil does. He makes you tell lies. And then after that, he says, I'm just, instead of reading, I won't tell you what happened if you don't know. David says, well, that didn't work because he laid outside his house and he wouldn't even go in his house, so I can't tell that lie. Let's see if I can't get him drunk and make him go into his own house. Boy, that's a good thing to try and cover up one sin, ain't it? Let's see if we can get somebody drunk and get them and make them think they did or make them do it and then tell everybody, see, there, he was drunk, he went home, he done that. And I'm telling you, this ain't my son. This ain't my child. <laughs> the thing is, Uriah still <laughs> would not do it. We need more Uriahs in the house of the Lord, don't we? That refuses to commit sin no matter what everybody else around us wants us to do. That's why we fall into sin most of the time anyway. It ain't because we want to, it's because somebody else wants us to. And then when we see how much they want us to, we feel like we're getting close to them and somebody needs me. And guess what? I'll do what they want me to do. And before you know it, you'll be wanting to do what they want you to do. And that's why and Uriah just would not fall into this sin. So you know what he does? David sends a man out to battle and he, tell, he, he sends him back. He tells Uriah, go back out in the battle. And he goes. And then he says, come here, I want you to go out there and I want you to put Uriah on the front line. He said, I can't fix this thing, so I'm just going to go ahead and end it. I'm going to go ahead and kill the man. That way he can't come kill me when he finds out what happened. Put him in the front of the line and had him killed. Boy, that sounds like a good godly man, don't it? Let's see. I'll bring him out of the battle and put him in his house and try to make him go in his house so it look, I'll look better and he'll look worse. If that don't work, I'll get him drunk. If that don't work, I'll have him killed and then I'll be all right. Really? <laughs> you got to go to sleep tonight. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You got to get up in the morning with a conscience that will not leave you and a spirit of God that will not leave you alone. Don't lose what you got for something you don't need. Is it worth it? Really? Yeah. 2 Samuel chapter well, let, let, let's look down in verse 11 chapter 11 it says in verse 25 and then we're going to read in chapter 12 then David said unto the messenger thus shalt thou say unto Joab let not this thing displease thee for the sword devoureth one as well as, uh, as other make thy battle more strong against the city and overthrow it and encourage thou him and when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done, but it displeased the Lord. Now David has not been confronted about his sin by man yet. No doubt God has confronted him every night he's laid down. I'll tell you, I know, I know he does because God don't overlook any sin. But what happens here is, I want you to notice, before chapter 12 where Nathan rebukes David, do you realize she's already had the child nine months has now passed since David committed sin and he has not done anything about it but covered up? We have a cat litter box in our house. You can cover it up all you want. In a little while it starts to stink. <laughs> Get that thing outside. It don't matter how much you cover up sin, it still stinks. Right. 
And it was stinking in the eyes of the Lord and in the, in the nostrils of God that David had done this. And God had given him nine... I mean, some people look at this and read chapter 11 and chapter 12 and think this was like the next day. Nine months has went by. She's had the child. And David is still holding on to the lie and the, and the sin that he committed and he will not do anything about it. So God sends a man to confront him. Read with me chapter 12 in case you don't know the Scriptures. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There went two men in one city, the, rich, the one rich and the other poor. So what Nathan is fixing to do here is he's going to give him like a parable, like Jesus did. He's going to give him a story and see David's response. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but I think I'm right on this. Nathan was David's son. That's right. If you study the lineage of David, he had a son named Nathan. And in a place in the Bible, it calls the prophet Nathan, but it does not call this man the prophet Nathan like it did that man. It does not say it in that order like it did the other Nathan. And I think, if you study the lineage of David, I've done it one time, I don't remember what all uh, the notes are, but this man Nathan could have been, very well could have been David's son. Do you know how hard it is to go to somebody and tell them about their sin and confront their sin? Do you know how much harder it would be to go to your own daddy and tell him? says, when he gives the story, David says, I mean, uh, Nathan says this. He said, there was two men in one city. The one was rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. This rich man had it all. He said, the poor man had nothing. Say, one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children, and did eat his own meat and drank his own, of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. Ain't that something? He, he told the story like this little lamb was this man's child. Like he held on to it and held it in its bosom and fed it, nursed it like he did his own child. He, the, what is he trying to do here? He's trying to drive home the point. They were close. They were close. They were like family. That's all he had. That's what he's trying to tell you. There came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming coming to him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. See, it was customary in Old Testament days when you had a man come through or a family come through, somebody traveling, and you had a visitor in your home that you killed a lamb or, or uh, something, and you, you, you done something to provide a meal for them and showed hospitality and gave them a place to stay and fed them. So what's happening here is he's telling a story as if a traveler's done come by this man's house, the rich man's house, and he looks out and he says, well, I could kill all one of many lambs I've got or whatever i got. He said, or... I could take that one little man's lamb over here from him and give it to that man and I can keep all my goods. So that's what he does. He goes and takes that one that belongs to somebody else instead of offering what he's got. Verse 5, David's anger was kindled against the man as some of y'all are about me now. David's anger was greatly kindled I, I don't know what you're thinking, but God does. <laughs> Verse 5 said, And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. David was so mad at this man in the story. I mean, he was telling him like it was a truth, like it was a fact, like it happened yesterday. And the Bible said, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. This man that took that one. You lamb from somebody else. This, this man's got to die. Verse 6, And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. You're the man in this story. Could you imagine a look on David's face when Nathan said that to him? Kind of like look on some of y'all's faces now. Are you calling me out, preacher? Are you trying to say that's me? I'm not, but if the Holy Ghost is, you better do something about it. He said, Thou art the man. 
Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house, thy master's wives unto thy bosom. I gave thee a house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had not, if that been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. He said, David, I blessed you abundantly, but I would give you so much more. If you, if you just do right, live right, I'll give you so much more, David. But what did you do? You took what I had, you squandered it, what I gave you, you threw it away, all because you wanted something that you didn't have when I blessed you with everything you already got. That's right. Verse 9, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword, now I want you to get this, if you get nothing else today. He said, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house. Because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. You know what he's saying? As you'll see in just a few minutes in the scripture, it tells you where God is letting David know, I can forgive you of this, but it will never be forgotten in your mind. There's going to be some repercussions to what you've done. Newsflash, sin always has consequences. Do you know if we could see the outcome of the decisions we make, we sure would make some of the decisions we do. If we seen the effects of some of the poor decisions we make, before we ever make them, we'd run and flee the very appearance of evil. If we saw all the people our decisions hurt, we'd flee the very appearance of evil. If we saw the hurt and the sleepless nights that we're going to go through in the future, we'd flee the very appearance of evil. We'd run from sin. We'd stay off the bank. We'd never fall into sin. And, and it's because we could see the outcome and know what God was going to allow to happen in our life because of the sin that we chose to commit when God said don't. I believe we'd run from it, don't you? Well, David had plenty of time. I think nine months is a pretty good long time to repent. I felt like sometimes a day was too much. I had to do it that day. Repent and get away from this sin and ask God for forgiveness. So he says in verse 11, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thee at thy wives before thine eyes and give thee unto the, thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the, his this son, I, I don't know for sure, but see if you get the same thing out of what he just said. He said, I will take thy wives before thine eyes, give them to, to thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. This day, David. Not tomorrow, not a year from now, but you're fixing to see some consequences today. Be, in this son, today. Before the sun goes down today, David, you're going to pay for some of the sin that you've already committed. Man, that's tough. I bet they were saying, I wish this day'd hurry up and get over with. About like y'all wish this service would. Verse 12, for thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. I know I'm doing a lot of reading, but bear with me, I can't tell the whole story. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die, David. He's saying you're confessing it. Now finally, you're coming to the point you confess your sin and realize you're the one that done wrong. You're confessing it and God is saying, I will have mercy on you. You will not die. And if you fell in this sin, thank God you're still alive and that God had mercy on you and did not take your life when He had every single right to. Your sin ain't no worse than mine or anybody else's. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, but had it not been for the mercy of God, we all be in hell with our back broke for the sin that we committed because God is full of grace, full of truth and mercy, and He's compassionate, and God loves us. God sheds His mercy upon our life, and we don't get what we deserve. I'm glad life ain't fair. That was my favorite saying as a kid, and my mama's worth saying to hear, is that life ain't fair. Every time they wanted to do something to me, I'd say, life ain't fair. It ain't fair. My daddy said, if you say it one more time, I'll backhand you. <laughs> I'm glad today that life ain't fair. Because I found out this old sinner should be in hell, but I ain't because of God's grace and mercy. Amen. 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 David said, Nathan, I've, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said, The Lord hath also put, also put away thy sin, and thou shalt not die. How be it, because thy, uh, uh, by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Whew. Listen, I know you don't want to pay the price of sin. 
You don't want to suffer the consequence of sin. I don't want to. You don't want to. Nobody, I'm telling you, if we could put it on a billboard and say, this is the consequence, this is what you want to do. You'll make the right decision or wrong. If we could see the consequence and outcome, we'd say, ah, no, 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 let me get out of here. I'm not going to do that. Amen. That's what we would do. That's what we would do. But here, he, he says this, you gave, you've given the enemies a great occasion to blaspheme. Christian, what they're saying is there's lost people watching your life and listening yeah. to your testimony. Yep. And by the life yeah. you're living, you're telling people, by the life you're living, the places you're going, the things you're doing, you're saying there ain't nothing to it. Right. Right. That's right. That person's lost and on their way to hell and it gives them great occasion to blaspheme what we teach and what we preach out of the Holy Bible and say that book don't mean nothing to them. It must not mean nothing to nobody. He said, David, you're the king of Israel and God has blessed you. He's, he's done all these things. He said, he, he's anointed you king over Israel. He's delivered you out of the hand of Saul. You took everything God gave you and you threw it away and now nobody respects you because of the sin you committed. But most of all, they don't respect the God you serve. Whew. I'm going to tell you what, if the consequences don't scare you enough, that ought to scare you to get away from sin. The fact that you're going to blaspheme the name of God by the sins that we commit. I'm telling you, this is bigger than you think. Amen. And the consequences are going to be far greater than you want to pay. Yeah. Whew, he said, The child also that is born of thee shall surely die. I want to say something. If, on that billboard, if David could have looked up and seen his child dying just a few days later after it was born, if he would have seen it on the billboard, he would have never... Went out on the rooftop. He would have never stayed at home when the battle was taking place. And he would have never invited her to come to his house. Amen. Any of us sitting here today, if we seen on a billboard the death of our own child as a consequence of a decision we made, we say, ain't no way I'm doing that. I'm going to get away from it before I ever have to suffer for that wrongdoing. Amen. You say, but we can't see that. God's showing you in this Bible right now. This is your billboard. Look at it. God's saying, don't do it. God's saying, flee the very appearance of evil. Run from it. Get away from it. And here's your consequences if you don't. That's good preaching. Amen. Amen. Nathan departed into his house. He left David. David... As alone now, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child. That means he prayed. David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. He's praying. He's asking God to have mercy. And the only reason this is happening is because David chose sin over righteousness. And the elders of his house arose and went to him and raised him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day, seven days of fasting and praying, that the child died. Yeah. Many people look at that and say, see, that prayer don't work, fasting don't work, the child died. All God's trying to tell you here is that there's consequences to Amen. sin. Amen. He's saying, you be forgiven of it. But the consequences are still there and there's a price to pay. That's right. Came to pass, he died. The servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him and he would not hearken to our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? He was about to go crazy for seven days fasting and praying when he found out the child was sick. Do you know why David was so, uh, so tortured by this? Because he already knew what Nathan had told him. Amen. He already knew. And he already knew the consequences and God wasn't going to change his mind. But when David saw his servants whispered, and so when he saw that his servants was whispering amongst themselves, David perceived, he understood that his child was dead. Therefore David said to the servants, is the child dead? They said, He is. David rose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. <laughs> I'm telling you what, if David 
can worship in a situation like this, surely we ought to be able to worship the Lord in the house of God with the Spirit of God moving, songs being sung, and pre uh, preachers preaching messages, and testimonies being given, and prayers praying. Surely we ought to be able to worship the Lord today in the house of God. Amen. David got up and worshiped. You say, wait a minute, how in the world can he worship? That's the same thing they were asking. Said then, he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Listen to this. Then said the servants to him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast, weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? David said, So I prayed and fasted. Maybe he'd be gracious to me. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't allow the child to die. Verse 23, But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? I shouldn't be fasting now. He's gone. Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. That's right. That's right. David was saying, and David was letting all of us know, children who die, go to heaven. God. That child never had an opportunity. It was only some days old. It never had an opportunity to accept Christ as a Savior, to be saved or believe in God. And the Bible said, David was saying, I can't bring that child back. Ain't no sense me praying now. It's over with. But I can't go where that child is. I can go to heaven when this life's over. But in my closing statements, or getting ready to close, I wouldn't say I'm closing yet. David had already suffered enough if you stop the story right here. Okay? Can any of y'all agree with that, that losing a child would be great enough punishment and enough suffering for what he'd done? Be enough for me. Wouldn't it be for you? I'd be waving the white flag. I surrender, Lord, please quit. Amen. But remember, he said the sword wasn't going to depart from his house. See, not only did he lose a child, but he lost control over his own kids that he had already. There was grudges, there was murder, there was incest, and there was rape amongst his own children. Do you say, really? Mm -hmm. Let's see, let's back up. David, here's the billboard. See that? See what your kids are going to do if you commit this sin? One of them's going to rape his sister. And then the brother's going to kill that brother for raping his sister. Now, do you want to commit sin or not? Yeah. Is it worth it? It ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. Ask David, is it worth it? David say, ain't no way it's worth it. If I could go back and turn back the clock, I'd change my mind. I'd have went back. I would have went to battle with my men. I'd have never stayed on the porch and I'd have never invited them to my home. I'd have done what's right had I seen the billboard before it was ever put up. Before it ever happened. If you ask David, was it worth it? I'm pretty sure David would tell you, no, it wasn't. The Bible says this, there's pleasure in sin for a season. I don't know about you, but I deer hunt and I turkey hunt. I know when the season starts, and I know when it's over. Right. And when it's over, all the fun of turkey hunting and deer season's over with. Right. Boy, I sure enjoy it when it's in, Brother Jeff. I like it. Yeah. I like to go out there and challenge myself to see if I can call a turkey up, and he's hard-headed. <laughs> I like to see if I can find the biggest buck, the smartest one in the woods, and try and kill him and eat him. I do eat everything I kill, by the way. So, so I, I knew that. But what I'm telling you is there's a time when it's fun, but then the season's over. And guess what? All that fun's over with too that happened in that season. Right. The Bible said there's pleasure in sin for a season, but after that, it's the judgment. It's like the credit card when you walk through the store. Whoosh, give me a buggy full. <laughs> Go home and play with your toys. It's all fun right now because you ain't paid for it yet. <laughs> About a month down the road, there's going to come the bill. Yeah. Guess what? All that month worth of playing and fun ain't fun no more. Because now you're paying for what you played with. You're yeah. paying yeah. for what you played yeah. with. Yeah. Come on, it's easy when you're getting it free. And the judgment ain't come yet. Give me two buggies. <laughs> Fill them up. When the bill comes, you say, take it all back. 
it's too late. It's time to pay. There's pleasure in sin for a season. But after this is the judgment. I beg you today, don't lose what you got for something you don't need. Amen. I'm asking you now, is it worth it? And before it ever happens, you ought to know now by the Scriptures that it ain't. But I promise you, if you fall into the sin after I preached it to you, and you fall into this sin, and I come back and ask you, was it worth it? I promise you. I don't care how far you go with it, where it takes you. You're going to tell me, preacher, it wasn't worth it. Amen. What I suffered and what I lost was not worth what I got. Adam and Eve was in bars of love. As Chris Hayes preached one time, they were in bars of love. When the bars was removed and God allowed them to do what they wanted, they got something and found out they didn't need it to start with. Right. And they didn't want it either. Yep. If you gave them another opportunity, they'd go back and say, put us back by the tree. Mm -hmm. Give us another opportunity and put back up the bars. And I'm telling you today, God is on your side. God loves you, God forgives you, and God wants you to move forward with Him, not backwards with the devil. And with every temptation the devil throws at you, there's a way of escape. And it is to look into the hills which comes your help and flee the very appearance of evil. If you don't want to fall into the sin that David and Bathsheba fell into, stay off the roof and stay out of the water. Walk in the Spirit of the Lord and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if you put yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time, you're going to be at this altar asking God, just like David did, please be gracious to me. Let's all stand.